Welcome to the fascist states of America. Since this is the United States, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. There's almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. They limit the ability of people of, through their government to regulate economic life for the benefit of people. It's essentially freeing corporations. Mm -hmm. You can't control their size, what they do financially, you can't put restrictions on them, you can't use government spending. This is what the free trade agreements are really about. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I'm your host today. Today our guest is Marty Hart Landsberg, who's a economics professor at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. Welcome to the show again. Thank you. It's a pleasure yeah, to be back. Good. Yes, yes. You were here last week mm -hmm. and we were talking about inequality and um, taking a large overview mm -hmm. of uh, what, uh, what needs to be done to um, Respond. <laughs> to, to, to respond, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. And uh, today we want to talk about one of the things we talked about then uh, in more detail, which is the whole corporate globalization mm -hmm. and the so-called free trade agreements. Right. So right now Obama, uh, you know, who campaigned, as part of his campaign said that we need to look at these trade agreements mm -hmm. that are already in existence and either renegotiate them or just you know mm -hmm. take a critical look at them mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this trans-pacific partnership is is this a new look uh, no <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and I think you know the, the way you started is really important because we often feel sort of whipsawed when we talked about inequality uh, last last time there's a sense of you know well um, when we try and raise our wages, you know, companies threaten to move, and, and it seems like, you know, how, how do we get into this situation? It is sort of a drop from the sky. And in fact, this globalization is very much of a corporate capitalist globalization. It's very much of a political project. It didn't happen out of thin air. And I think one of the reasons why it's so important to study free trade agreements is you can see the political hand there, that the, the restriction of government, the promotion of corporate freedom and mobility and power doesn't just happen. It, it happens as, as an agenda. And so that's kind of the last time we had a poster here that said inequality is a political choice. And so you're saying corporate globalization yes. is a political choice. Very also. much so. And one of the things I think that's made it very hard to resist for most people um, is that if there's one thing that economists seem to agree on, it's that free trade and free trade agreements are good. I mean, I could say as an economist, almost anything. I'm for taxes or I'm for this. But if I say I'm against free trade, I'm really on the an outlier. Uh -huh. And there's one thing that Republicans and Democrats, you know, we keep talking about how Obama Republicans don't want to support anything that Obama does. It was Obama who rescued the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, put it in motion, saw its completion, and with the support of Republicans. Mm -hmm. And it's so President Obama who's promoting this trans-Pacific partnership free trade agreement, again with the support of, of Republicans. So there seems to be such a strong consensus, and anyone who's studied economics has learned about comparative advantage and free trade, and it seems like it's supposed to be good, even though the results seem bad, and I think it kind of makes people unconfident about opposing it. And so what I hope we can talk about is why they should have the confidence yeah. uh, right. <laughs> um, to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to throw a little history yeah. in there, uh, the first trade agreement was NAFTA, the North America mm -hmm. Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that was the second one, but uh, that's the first major, big one. Yeah, the first big one with Mexico, Canada, the United mm -hmm. States, and of course that was originally proposed by uh, Bush the first. Right. Right. 
uh, and then um, Bill President Clinton. Clinton, the Democrat, mm -hmm. so a Democrat or a mm -hmm. Republican first, and then yep. Democrat, actually was able to push that through That's Congress, right. Right. right? And so we're seeing that same kind of thing yep. now yep. with uh, the Bush second proposed mm -hmm. three, actually four agreements. Mm -hmm. Uh, one with Panama, one with Colombia, and mm -hmm. one with South right. Korea. And it took and Obama, it took to, Obama to actually push to those them. through yeah. Congress, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. So this is a very this powerful is a, consensus, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. This is the, this is by uh, a, a by a partisan uh, yes. campaign. Exactly. Sure. Okay. Exactly. And and to go back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, so that's an agreement that started in 2005 with uh, four countries: uh, Brunei, Chile. New Zealand and Singapore. And then in 2008, the U.S. got interested in joining it, and in 2010, joined um, um, Australia, Malaysia, Peru, and Vietnam. So there's now these nine countries who are negotiating this. And uh, President Obama said he hopes that this would be completed maybe in 2013, some people say 2014. Japan, Mexico, and Canada have voiced their desires to join, but the nine countries led by the U.S. are saying, we don't want anyone to join until we've finished this because we want to make a very strong free trade agreement and then other countries will have to join on our terms. So, um, so, so it's going to be a take it or leave it for the other countries. Right. And to this point, like all the other agreements, um, the U.S. trade representative is negotiating it. There are about 600 multinational corporations on a number of different advisory committees who work with the trade representative to shape the agreement. Congress doesn't know what's in the agreement. American people don't know what's in the agreement. Only the trade representative and these multinational corporations. And in fact, Senator Wyden has asked to see the agreement, to see what's being negotiated. He's the head of the uh, International Trade Committee, and he's been told no, mm -hmm. that it, it's not to be shared. Some. Yeah, I I heard that what they had what they had told him was that he could see it if he would go into a room oh, right. by himself with the documents no in front of him, no, yeah. no paper, yes. no no cell phones, yes. no nothing. That's right. And that after he looked at it, uh, he could not share anything that he learned with anybody. Quite a deal. Uh, quite a deal. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> some items have leaked out, and so we have an idea. Now, I would say we had a good idea anyway, just from looking at the U.S. Korea trade agreement and some of these others that have come through, the U.S. has a fairly clear position. And so I want to just sort of talk about drawing on some of these things to show why this is really a corporate project, why we should have the confidence to reject this. Uh -huh. Not try and modify it, not try and improve it, but there's nothing in these free trade agreements for working people. Um, the first thing to say is that every once in a while you see the studies will be done. Uh, like with the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, a study was done and we said, oh, we're going to get X number of jobs, we're going to benefit this. You see this a lot with the WTO, where the World Bank and others will do studies. And they always show these large gains, and then the numbers are paraded in the press and economists get up and talk about it. What people really don't know is what goes into these studies. So they're very complex. They're, they're based on what's called computable general equilibrium models. And the idea is that if you change a tariff, you're changing the price of a good. If you have a tariff, you raise the price of an import, you get rid of the tariff, the price changes. The price changes, your demand changes. Your demand changes, then, you know, uh, if, if steel becomes cheaper, you might build more cars, then, you know, it changes the car market. So what you want to do is think of all these countries joined together and model what changes in tariffs will mean, because free trade agreements mean dropping tariffs. So how will this all work out? And there are, the UN and other gr groups have huge databases where they know, because you have to say, well, how do, how do U.S. auto consumers respond and how long will it take them? And how sensitive are our Japanese uh, clothing buyers and producers of electronics? So you have to really model these things. And it's a very complex modeling. To do it requires some assumptions. And people may not believe this. Hopefully they can see I'm a trustworthy individual, but you can go online. I, 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 I vouch for it. Good, thank you. <laughs> but you can go online and read the studies, and the assumptions that are made are full employment, that all resources in a country are perfectly mobile in a country, but they never leave the country, so capital never leads, leaves, oh. and, and that um, trade will always remain balanced. 
So now, if I were to say, gee, I'm worried about a free trade agreement because it might cause unemployment, it might cause trade imbalances, it might cause capital flight, these economists say, you don't have to worry about that, we've assumed them away. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh -huh. These are assumptions built in the model. So naturally, if you have a world where everyone is fully employed and you import and resources just shift away from the area of imports, and because trade balances, you're going to be exporting more, always full employment, uh -huh. balance, everything is great. All these studies that claim to show the outcome of these free trade agreements are built on assumptions that rule out all the concerns we have. And they, rule out, they, they really rule out the real world. They do. Yeah. So, I mean, this is ideology, not social science. Uh -huh. You're not really investigating what happens. Mm -hmm. You start by ensuring that these outcomes will be good. Yeah. Um, and in fact, if these assumptions aren't met, it is very easy to show theoretically that a free trade agreement could produce a worsening situation for working people. So just on the start of, these, of this tariff notion, there's no support for this. And in fact, the government has, has lied very, very clearly. And I'll give you one quick example and then talk more about these agreements. Ron Kirk, the um, trade rep uh, um, Don Kirk, the trade representative, announced that the U.S.-Korea agreement was important because it would generate 70,000 new jobs for, for Americans. And President Obama repeated that. And where did he get that number? So first he took these studies, one study that was done using computable general equilibrium modeling, and it said how, many more, how much more exports we would have to Korea if this happened. And then he took a Commerce Department study that says every export is tied to a certain number of jobs. So he took the 10 billion... 12, 15 billion increase in exports, came up with the jobs, and said 70,000. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't subtract the increase in imports, which would, if exports promote jobs, imports oh, would lose right. jobs. Uh -huh. He didn't bring that into play. If you do that, it, it reduced that total by 60%. Moreover, the computable general equilibrium models talk about the fact that if tariffs go down in Korea, some goods we may have exported to Malaysia will now export to Korea. Mm -hmm. So not all the exports to Korea are new exports. Mm -hmm. There's no new jobs from that. The fact is, they had no idea whether this would create new jobs or not, but they pretended they did with these numbers. Uh -huh. So most of what we read about that, that, that's put out by the government and economists to defend these free trade agreements isn't believable. It's not based on serious historical analysis. And what uh -huh. we know from NAFTA what we know from China coming in the WTO, what we know from all this, is that every time we've signed a free trade agreement, our trade balance with those countries have actually worsened and, and jobs have been hurt. So that's one thing, just on that simple matter. The, the other, and, and I think to me even more important, and it gets to the political project, is that these free trade agreements are not just about tariffs, but that's all people talk about. And that is because if anyone has had the I don't know if it's a good fortune or bad fortune to take a principles of economics course. <laughs> they learn about how free trade is good. Oh, right. uh, and it's, you know, rooted in their mind. And so everyone knows that. And so all they talk about when they talk about a free trade agreement is this lowering tariff and more trade. But in the case of the Korea agreement, there were 24 chapters. And we know from leaks that most of these chapters are in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So what are some of these chapters? Uh -huh. And this is where we see corporate power. One of them is called the Government Procurement Agreement. And that says that governments may not use non-economic criteria in making purchases. So if you want to um, pave roads, um, buy streetcars, you can't take labor rights into account. You can't take environmental standards uh, of the of the company into account. Uh -huh. You can't take into account whether they would hire local workers. You can't take into account any of those things. You know, all you can do is take into account the price that the company is offering. Hmm. Now, why they say that's free trade is because anything else seems like it would be discriminating against companies competing. But think about that. Those are those other factors are really what defines a democracy. Those are really the factors that we 
get to say what kind of world we want to see. Sure, exists. and this is even public money. This is our government yeah. uh -huh. promoting the values that we want. So who benefits from that? Well, of course, corporations, mm -hmm. because they're no longer going to be penalized if they have bad labor rights, environmental, or, yeah. or anything. But this is a crit one critical chapter in these free trade agreements, and you can go online and you can read them and see exactly what, what they do. Another one, and one of the most important one, is um, the financial services agreement. And because finance is so important in the U.S., the finance industry got everything it wanted in the U.S.-Korea agreement, and I'm sure that they're building on that in this one. You can't limit... Um, this is written for government, so like Korea government can't do this to U.S. finance, U.S. government can't do this to Korean finance. But I think, in my opinion, once you can't, no government is going to put their own companies at a disadvantage uh, yeah. and give benefits to, to foreign companies and not their own, so it will spread. But you can't limit the number of financial institutions. So Korean government can't limit the number of U.S. financial institutions. U.S. can't limit the number of Korean. You can't limit their size. You can't limit the number of activities they undertake. And let me just stop there for a second. What would that mean? We worry about too big to fail. Mm -hmm. You can't put any limits. Uh, we worry about separating financial banking from commercial banking. We talked about the, the, um, you know, uh, the financial speculation that happened and the, and the need to, to bring back Glass-Steagall. Right. This free trade agreement makes that illegal. If we try to do that, a foreign financial institution, and there are many Korean ones, could sue the U.S. government and say, you're, you're limiting what we can do. Um, and and, and it, wouldn't just be, it wouldn't just be Korean uh, companies that might sue the United States, but it could be branches or subsidiaries of American banks based in Korea. Yes, that could be. that's right, exactly okay. right. So, uh, so pretty soon, under these conditions, it couldn't be imposed on anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you couldn't limit, you couldn't restrict derivative trading because, you know, um, you can't have capital controls. So, just as an example, this is a critical part of the free trade agreement. I, I, I would challenge your viewers to say, when did they hear in the discussions of free trade agreement this restriction? One of the biggest ones, and I brought um, the wording because I want people to really appreciate uh -huh. this, is the investment chapter which not only says that governments cannot put performance requirements on foreign investment, but here's the part that I think is really critical. Um, the chapter grants foreign corporations protection from expropriation. So we think, what does expropriation mean? It means the government comes and takes your company. But these chapters have something that, that's called indirect expropriation. So what is an indirect expropriation? And here, um, that's any action, I'm quoting now, that has an effect equivalent to direct expropriation without former transfer of title or outright seizure. So what does that mean? It means basically if the government does something that restricts the ability of a foreign company to fully use its asset. And what the, the this is from the U.S.-Korea investment chapter. It says, how do you determine that? Well, it has to be a case-by-case, fact-based inquiry that considers all relevant factors. For example, the extent to which the government action interferes with distinct, reasonable, investment-backed expectations, and the character of the government action, including its objectives and context. Relevant considerations could include whether the government action imposes a special sacrifice on the particular investor or investment that exceeds what the investor or investment should be expected to endure for the public interest. Hmm. Beyond that, if a company thinks that what the government did interferes with what they thought was reasonable, or they thought it was too pa uh, pa painful, what they expected, they can sue in an international tribunal. So, so, <laughs> so if they think right. that they're being harmed right. more than they should be, right. then they get to sue. Right. So, for example, if the government said, we're going to have land use planning, you still own the land, but you can't do X that you could have before, if it was a U.S. company, they'd have to just take it. Uh -huh. But if it's a foreign company, they can now sue in an international tribunal 
uh, and have a, 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 a tr a trade lawyers determine whether this was reasonable or not. And we have examples from NAFTA, which has something similar, to show that the trade, uh, and I don't want to go to all, we don't have a lot of time, but there was a big case about Lowen, uh, which was a funeral home, Canadian funeral home, that lost a case, appealed the Mississippi Supreme Court's decision, and to an international tribunal. The tribunal said, you're right. Um, the U.S. court was wrong. We would overturn it. But in the meantime, you became a U.S. company, so you're no longer protected. But they showed in words that they didn't feel bound by any U.S. law. Mm -hmm. So this is part of this agreement. And what will happen, of course, is that governments are going to be fearful of imposing regulations that could leave them liable to sue. So, so would, this, uh, would this only be... Um Challenges to federal law, or would it all, affect all units to, of government? All units of government, all so units right of government. down to our city government. Yeah. Yep. So the point here is that there are, there are many. I, I don't have, we don't have time to talk about them all. But what do they all have in common? They limit the ability of people of, through their government to regulate economic life for the benefit of people. It's essentially free corporations. Mm -hmm. You can't control their size, what they do financially. You can't put restrictions on them. You can't use government spending. This is what the free trade agreements are really about. They're about an exercise of power. And then we suddenly find ourselves in a position where we say, our governments are weak, our, you know, companies can do what they want to do. Well, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. It happens because of a political project. Free trade agreements make that extremely visible. Well. It should make it extremely visible, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> right. We don't have a media that will talk about right. these things. And so the question then becomes, you know, how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, you know, passed, um, even though people were raising questions. In, in my opinion, a lot of their attempts to deal with this were not very, unions and so, other social movements were not very effective. They, they didn't really focus on all these chapters. I think if people really focused on these chapters and said, now, what does this have to do with trade? Mm -hmm. This has to do with power, right? Um, then I think maybe people would come to understand more. And what ends up happening is we get into the nuances of oh, how did the Columbia Agreement differ from the Korea Agreement, differ from the Trans-Pacific mm -hmm. Partnership? And what happens then is people who get drawn into resisting one don't understand that they should resist the other. And what makes me nervous then is that we're in a period where unions and other groups are calling for the Obama administration to revise the agreement. I don't know what revision, I don't know what's in this agreement yeah. mm -hmm. that I would even want to save. Mm -hmm. uh, we did perfectly well without free trade agreements. The free trade agreements, like I'm talking about, just accelerate the movement of capital. They accelerate the power of corporations. They weaken workers, not just in the U.S., but in the case of the Korea agreement, Korean workers as well. Um, why would we even start by assuming that these are somehow things we would want to modify? Mm -hmm. They're literally extensions of the very same things that are happening to us. What's happening to us? Our government is being marginalized. Our public programs are being reduced. Finance has been deregulated. Companies are free to do what they want. Free trade agreements are an extension of that. Mm -hmm. And the struggles against free trade agreements often don't connect back to that show where they come from. Yeah. Um, and, 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 then, and then I think the critical point, why I'm so pleased to be on your show, is that these kinds of issues are never raised. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've debated professional economists who've never read all these chapters, oh. right? <laughs> yeah. or, or they don't know the assumptions made in the studies which produce these outcomes. They're so ideologically accepting of free trade as being mm -hmm. efficient. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real critical problem. And we have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is moving down the line again. And I fear that in the midst of all this, um, you know, we're not really mounting an effective campaign. And one of the reasons is because people often see free trade agreements as separate from the political struggles to defend the public sector, regulate corporations, when in fact they're just a very obvious extension of these very same trends. Yeah. For, for the Alliance for Democracy, mm -hmm. we have, of course, been involved with uh, attempting to eliminate corporate personhood. And so in doing that, one of the things I like to say is that um, these free trade agreements take that corporate personhood, mm -hmm. which has been institutionalized at the national level here, and take them to the international and the global yeah. level. 
and that's why we need to all, all of those things mm -hmm. that we don't like about corporate personhood yeah. uh, are then taken to the international level with decisions being made by these international trade tribunals yeah. which nobody knows where they're at or where they come from right. but yeah. they know we know you know, at least in this uh, case that mm -hmm. you indicated yeah. where they were happy just to disregard our law yeah. entirely. Yeah. They said as a, this Canadian company was treated unfairly. And uh -huh. So, so um, I think that's really critical. And I think what's, what's critical is, is for, you know, for people to really go beyond the critique that, you know, this agreement is, is not right or, you know, campaign financing, but uh -huh. see the, the whole of it. Right. That there is power being used, uh, back to your sign that you uh, yeah. mentioned uh -huh. at the beginning, um, that we are, in, in, we are in a political struggle here, that, that corporate power is being used to create a world that maximizes their profits and their power, and it's very directly costly to us. Right. And somehow we, we are fooled, uh, unfortunately, by economists who legitimize many of these things, and the media, which doesn't really call attention to this. And so I think programs like yours become very important. We, we need an alternative media that we can trust, yeah. that we can understand. And then I think what's really important is to have the confidence mm -hmm. to say, yeah. I don't care what you say. We know these don't work. They haven't worked. Look what's really in them. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about modifying. We're talking about rejecting right. them. Yeah. yeah, so we have a little less than one minute. So real quickly, talk about your blog. So uh, I have a blog called Reports from the Economic Front. And if you search with, for that, you, you will find it. And about once a week, I try and do a post where I take some critical economic issue like, like this uh, or development or argument and go through it, highlight it, provide some clarity and some political understanding. Okay. So it's a way for me to kind of keep up on what's going on and hopefully share that information with other people. Yeah, yeah. and I, I read them. I get them thank every you. week. I read them every week, and I really appreciate the insight. So uh, well, I you recommend that, that uh, our audience uh, sign up for it good. and receive them. So good. Thank you. We've been talking with Marty Hart Landsberg with um, um, political science professor at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland. Thank you for being our guest again. My pleasure. All right, great. So uh, that concludes our program. I'll never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Want to watch an episode again? Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. We're also available on Blip TV. Search for Populist Dialogues. Subscription is available there also. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more about us, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. I want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Don Bayham, and Richard Hatch. Without them, we wouldn't be on the air. That would be a shame. I want to thank the audience also. Uh, without you, there wouldn't be any reason for us to be on the air. So we hope that we will see you again next week. Bye.